for those who have never seen Ignite, this is basically the most fun format of the conference. All speakers have 20 slides. The slides auto forward every 15 seconds. And yeah, that's about it. So, you ready? Hello, so I am Japioto. I work at Inuits, and I want to speak to you about uh, something called JSONnet. So, uh, you probably uh, all know something called uh, YAML. So, YAML is a nice configuration format, but uh, it's mainly written by humans, and it's not that practical to write that by a computer. So, um, but it uses a lot, a lot of different projects nowadays. And uh, if you do something that's developer related, then you probably know YAML already. Uh, JSON is the same, but like for computers, you have that into the uh, some APIs. You have that uh, when you do some web development, some JavaScript. So uh, JSON is also quite popular. But if you need to write them yourself, it's quite complicated. The good news is that uh, JSON is a subset of YAML. Uh, which means that if you write a document in JSON, it will also be perfectly uh, YAML valid. So if you can find a way to write JSON files, then you also have a way to write YAML files. It means that if you are a YAML engineer, then you are not a JSON engineer. But if you are a JSON engineer, then you become a YAML engineer automatically, because you can write valid uh, YAML files out of the box. So you can decide if you want to be a JSON engineer or a YAML engineer. So. And then comes JSONnet. So JSONnet is uh, a DSL that enables you to write uh, JSON uh, data uh, in a nice way. So it's like JSON on steroids. You can generate uh, JSON files. And it means that because YAML is a superset of JSON and uh, JSON is a superset of JSONnet, then all the JSON files are valid JSONnet. Every JSON is valid YAML. So, and because JSONnet compiles to JSON, it can also generate YAML. Uh, JSONnet is a uh, code that is owned by Google. It's open source. It's written in C++. Uh, you can find it on Google. There, is, there are also Docker images that enable you to compile uh, stuff using JSONnet. And now I show you some example of a JSON uh, JSONnet file. So JSONnet takes that kind of thing as input. So you see that uh, you can use some variables. You can use uh, a lot of different stuff. And this doesn't look like a JSON at first sight. But it eventually it gets compiled into a valid JSON file like this. So uh, you write uh, your data into uh, a DSL language, and you get a nice uh, JSON file as output. Uh, the nice thing about JSONnet is that uh, it is really made. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of stuff. That, it does have a lot of stuff that JSON does not have, like comments. You cannot have comments in a JSON file, but in JSON it is perfectly valid to have uh, G comments in uh, your uh, files. You can uh, also put comma uh, at the end of the maps and the arrays, which you cannot do in JSON. This is not JSON valid, but JSON it enables you to do that because that's what human people do, right? They don't always like remove the last comma at the end of the arrays. Um, you also have. Uh, a lot of simplicity, like uh, you don't need to uh, code uh, the, the items in your uh, maps, that kind of things, because yeah, it's not really useful in JSON, but it's required, so you need to do it. But JSON, it, you can just uh, forget that. You also can use variables. Uh, you have loops. You have a lot of functions. So you can actually uh, put the data outside of uh, your JSON template or uh, even in other files, like we'll see in a moment. So that's also a very nice feature of JSON at the variables. The functions, like if you want to reuse a, a JSON pattern, a JSON object, then you can just use functions to do that. You can define your own functions, uh, F parameters. Uh, so that also produces valid JSON at the end. You can uh, import files, so you can import a library, uh, a, a JSON library, to just reuse uh, the content of that library and just um, uh, generate your JSON file based on a uh, library so you don't repeat yourself for uh, creating JSON files. Uh, there is a standard library that uh, enables you to do everything you would expect from a library, like uh, replace maps, uh, loops, uh, all that kind of uh, standard things uh, are available in JSONnet as well. 
And if you want to use it, it's very easy. Just JSON it, and then the name of the JSON it file, it will go to a CD out. You can also render multiple files at the same time uh, using the dash M option. And also, you don't need to format your JSON it file yourself. You can just run JSON it FMT. Uh, in real life, there is uh, JSON it, which is quite uh, known, which uh, enables you to create some uh, Kubernetes templates. Uh, but basically, you can uh, use it in multiple uh, languages if you want to embed it in your application, there are bindings for a lot of stuff. And my personal use case is I'm writing a, a JSON net library to create Grafana graphics. So if you want to automate your Grafana graph configuration, just take a look at that and try it and uh, make per request. Thank you. Okay, uh, I want to talk about uh, why everything is uh, so confusing. Uh, <laughs> I wrote this uh, on the plane on the way here, uh, trying to get my head around uh, all the problems that uh, we are going to be here discussing. So who am I? Uh, my name is Mike Place. Uh, I run the engineering teams at uh, SaltStack. Uh, those of you who uh, came to my last talk know that uh, I've been around the config space for a long time, back when I was uh, using Puppet. Uh, some of the original authors of Puppet would come to my office and their kids would play under my desk. Uh, and uh, that was a time right in, during the, uh, the mid-1990s, uh, which is a time I enjoyed very much, uh, because I felt like uh, everything was simple and easy. And uh, people complain about racking servers. I loved racking servers. I loved machines where we actually ran multiple services on a single machine, right? Like, we have TCP ports. This seemed like a good idea. Frankly, it still seems like a pretty good idea. Uh, services ultimately were the light of the world. But all of a sudden, like a big bang, virtualization came along and changed everything. Uh, suddenly, uh, efficiency got reframed. It used to be that efficiency was all about recompiling kernels. All of a sudden, efficiencies were about restructuring our operating systems. So what happened to configuration as this space evolved uh, so rapidly? Uh, one of the things that I think is that configuration started to take on uh, a couple of new uh, roles. All right, the first of these roles, uh, well, okay. Uh, so the sets of roles that configuration took on as we move from virtualization uh, into containerization uh, had to start to mirror the way our applications were being redesigned on top of the infrastructure that they were running on. So the first new role that uh, I see for configuration is not simply managing uh, the machine as it's provisioned, but is to manage the ongoing state of the machine. The interesting thing about configuration in 2018 and configuration management in 2018 is that we're gradually reducing the time slice that we're concerned about configuration. It used to be every so often we'd reconfigure send mail uh, and and you know, that was the end of our week. Uh, and then uh, we have orchestration, right? So because we're interdependent between these pieces and we have dynamic reconfiguration because these machines are getting to the point and this infrastructure are getting to the point where they need to reconfigure themselves based on the ongoing state of the application, uh, which is something that we didn't used to have to face. So if we're gonna think about configuration management, what potential, what terms might we think about that are somewhat more applicable. Uh, because every so often somebody comes to me and says, configuration management, is that still a thing? And I say, well, look, the fundamental principles are still there, but there might be a better term. And so uh, here's a quote that I made up uh, on the plane, which is that the idea of statelessness is a, it's a lie that we tell ourselves when we've abstracted systems too far away from actual reality. Because no matter what, the idea of configuring systems is the idea of managing system state, and that's never, 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 never going to change. Uh, the idea of uh, systems management and configuration management these days is still the idea that we need systems to enforce the promises that they are making. So 
One of the problems that we're starting to face today is how we can model these complex applications uh, in these infrastructures that are increasingly more challenging. One of the things that I think we're really bad at right now is figuring out how to reason about the systems that we've deployed. In effect, the best thing that we have if you bring a new engineer on board is to go, oh, okay, here's a couple of Visio diagrams and these are shit, and here's a little wiki page that we use to describe our infrastructure and this is shit, and maybe take a look at some manifests and maybe take a look at a little bit of YAML. This is the way in 2018 that we're able to reason about the infrastructures that we have. And that's a huge, huge, huge problem, right? Uh, you heard me talk about this uh, in my talk if you came. One question I think we need to think about this year, why are we so bad at being able to measure the complexity of these systems beyond simply being, it's, it's simply being difficult for us to describe the state of the systems itself? We can't even figure out how to measure the complexity of these systems. But this is a historical problem. Um, in 1954, linguists tried to measure the complexity of language, and this problem was so hard that it effectively stayed unsol unsolved for almost 50 years, right? So the takeaway is the question, how can we model infrastructure and applications in 2018 so that we know when we're removing complexity, right? What number can you point to in 2018 that says, my application, my infrastructure is 10% less complex than it was 18 months ago? Thanks. Hi, I'm Florian, and yesterday was really interesting when Adam said that you need to dig into some topics for months. And I had been asked last year to speak or to look into risks, avoiding outages done through configuration management. And one of the things I was looking at was human errors, but basically I went through research since the 60s or something. Um, a fun thing is humans aren't a really big source of error, but of course we like to blame them because they're around. Um, but we are also the only thing which, which can fix designs. Um, most of the stuff goes back to after Three Mile Island nuclear power plant almost blew up, and they were discussing to just put everything under military control because they didn't trust corporations. Um, I also do, uh, went through well, an overview of all kinds of research that was done. It was about, are you falling asleep at work? Are you going to like uh, repeat something and do it wrong the fifth time or so? And this has all been very well researched. This is some example of how you write instructions. And if you think of how we do documentation, normally it's not on that quality level. So if you read this, and I would ask you in a few minutes, you would still remember some parts of that. Um, Basically, it's simple. You put things in caps, you have a documentation structure, and normally we don't bother. We're just happy if we manage to write documentation at all. And by being more structured with that, you can actually support humans being better than uh, what you had in the start. That process is called human reliability and analysis and then engineering if you make something of it. It also comes back from nuclear power. And it's done by researchers, so it's not just the people who build the plants, but experts. What are these experts looking at? This is an example for a power outage at a reactor, like we had a few years back, and it didn't go well. Um, what they found at the start was that the design uh, didn't think of where the opening valves in a reactor should be so that you can reach them if the reactor has melted. And that's what they suggested. Maybe put them on the ground floor so that you're not in 200 degrees and uh, burning while you open them. Um, the thing is, this is done by researchers and statisticians. Um, so this is a mathematical approach, and we have a lot to learn there. The most important parts for us, for our work, are distractions. I, I think everybody knows those. Light, noise, how much the task load is, and so on. But there's also research on how well humans can process, uh, process data. So I didn't know that I will make more errors if I read text and numbers or something than if I don't. But this is all research since the 70s. Um, this is even cooler. So if you want to pick between training or giving people enough time to do their tasks, 
uh, one is going to fix the issue, which is giving them enough time. The other one is mostly useless. Um, and then I found the worst thing. Uh, engineers constantly do this stuff to avoid errors. They tried talking to IT people at the universities and they were d turned down for decades. So if we want to improve how reliable systems are, we have to change that and we have to start talking to them. And one, of, uh, one thing which is holding us back is some misconceptions, like this five nines are a myth. There is a lot of uh, safety critical systems who run at, mu uh, run at, at much higher uptimes than we think about in our normal life. Yeah, and I think as complexity goes up, we're getting into the area where these systems are. We can have people die to our problems, and so on. And we will be regulated if we don't start doing something, and we have to read up on the stuff and start talking with researchers. We can't do it on our own. We will not figure that out. They already did it. Uh, here's some reading advice. The first one is the most interesting. It's about how you cannot avoid errors if your systems go too big. And there is also some software I found which is not only in research papers, but you can actually download. Um, the, the lowermost part is the most interesting. Fault injection is what separates these safety critical systems from what we do. And fault injection is not just turning them off, it's really modifying the data you're running through them and so on, and exposing errors. Uh, yeah, and stop trusting root cost analyzed blog posts we're seeing because none of them are done by any proper methodology like they're done in the other industries, for, like aviation. We're not doing that. And so the key lesson is the last line. If we work on this, we should work under actual researchers who know the stuff. We're the experts who give the input, not the other way around. And yeah, so the next thing I'm going to do is I found some uh, guy who tested reactors. And I found a friend of mine, a normal teacher, knows about all this reliability stuff because it's done for every car part. And I take some IT guy and I just put them together and see what happens. Because I think this has to start now. And us IT people just need to go there and, and start talking to them. Thank you. Hi there. I always feel like a bit of an interloper at this conference because I come from the deep, dark world of ITSM. But actually, one of the things I've come to talk about is a methodology that I'm finding is getting a lot of traction in the DevOps community as well as the ITSM community. And it addresses a problem that a lot of you might find, which is if you work in large enterprises, typically you know, the new way bubbles up from small teams. But eventually, you start getting successes and building products and getting users. And often that means things get folded into mainstream support channels. And it's not to be, I shouldn't do ITSM down too much because that top level of support, they're pretty good at that. IT, ITSM has changed service desks from post-it notes to quite a professional scalable thing. The challenge though comes from the fact that you'll be inserted as specialists into the bottom of this clunky three-tier structure. And it relies on things cascading down. You know, if the top tier can't fix it, then it might go to another tier. And eventually, it kind of wends its way down to third line support. And that's, that's not really very good. There's a, there's a number of problems with that. I mean, firstly, we're putting our best people at the bottom of the process. You know, the answer's probably there, but it might spend two days at the top level, two more days at the second level. What you get is a problem you could have solved quickly, and you've got a really angry customer, which is not a good way for it to start when it comes to you. This also encourages ticket tennis. Often the people at the top level just don't quite know what to ask. And so it comes down another level and then, oh, that, then we need some more clarification. You know, back up it goes. And it's not uncommon to see tickets bounce around six, eight, ten times. Again, very pissed off customer. One more problem. It's siloed. There's no real sharing of information. So you often end up with some very high value people ending up picking up a lot of these five-day-old tickets and being overwhelmed with that work. And really, we don't want them to be fixing stuff. We want them to be building stuff. You, know, you folks are changing the industry. You don't want to do that if you're just responding to tickets. So everything I've just described is everything that DevOps and Lean isn't. You know, we've got queues. We've got silos. Communication is reassignment, which is fundamentally asynchronous. And that's why we're bringing swarming here. You know, that's why 
our, at BMC we're doing this, we're seeing a lot of other companies completely trying to trash that three-tier support structure and bring in something that's much more dynamic. And, and a, an organization called the Consortium for Service Innovation is helping to drive this. I want to show you how you, we do this at BMC. You know, so, so we have new issues come through, quick prioritization, um, and actually there's always going to be those red flag items that just have to be solved. And we have what we call a severity one swarm, but this is nothing really new. It's a bunch of people on call out. They, they're effectively in a war room. They pull together who they need to get things fixed. Yeah, as I say, there's nothing really novel about that. But where we are introducing a lot of novelty is instead of this sort of first line, second line, we have what we call a dispatch swarm. And these people are just fundamentally cherry picking. They, they sit every hour, they watch what's coming in, they figure out what can be fixed quickly. You know, they don't get tied up in the fact that this has got a five day target, it's low priority, this one's higher priority. They just identify things they can fix quickly. They sit together on chat ops tools. They, they actually pair up experienced support team members with, with new people or, or with people from other areas. So there's a lot of knowledge dissemination. And they can fix a percentage of things, but other things still go to technical teams in that third line or whatever the equivalent is for us. But there's another problem that happens there, which is often things linger and often things are passed around from technical team to technical team. We no longer even let people assign them like that. If, if something's going to bounce, it has to go to a backlog swarm. And these are very ad hoc, periodic, you know, maybe every three days, every week, groups of people from all over the place, support teams, technical teams. Their aim is just to focus on challenging issues, but bring together skills from other areas. They're given a lot of autonomy. You know, there's no real rules. Just figure out a way to meet up and get these things fixed. We're pretty manual still, but organizations like Cisco are also thinking a lot about how they can automate the bringing together of those teams. It's hard when you're new in an organization to know who's who. And so a lot of the work we're now doing is focusing on even things like how we use AI to figure out who'd be great people to work for. But by doing all this, whether it's manual or automated, it's much better fit for uh, hopefully people like you. It draws on those lessons from lean, from DevOps. You know, it, it breaks silos, it shares knowledge, it, it, it stops this communication being so asynchronous. And our results have been pretty incredible, actually. Very, very quickly, we noticed huge upticks in both process measures and outcome measures. And importantly, that, that bottom line, we've got people now more free to innovate, both in the development teams, but also the support teams. My favorite quote about all this, this is one of the most experienced people on the Remedy product line. He's been around a long time. And even he, in a year, felt that his product knowledge, and, and you'd think there was nothing he could really learn, he doubled his knowledge in a year, just from the fundamentally better knowledge sharing that comes with this structure. So if you'd like a little more information, I'd really advocate that we push for this. You know, I, I don't want to see you, I'm a modernizer, I don't want to see you caught up in all these old structures as, as, as the work you do goes mainstream in enterprises. So the left-hand link is the Consortium for Service Innovations page. I've got a long-form blog that's got a lot of attention. It's been <coughs> cited by Gene Kim and others, so it's, it's definitely getting interest, and I've tweeted those links for you. Thanks very much. Hi, I'm Bob Walker, and for the next 23 days, I'm the head of the web operations uh, community at the Government Digital Service. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, he, him, or they, them. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about are we all YAML engineers now? Um, so it's a good question, and to us, having been here for the rest of the week, obviously it's quite obvious we are now YAML engineers, but we'll get to that eventually. Um, so I've been thinking about this for a while, and to us, the other thing is, or are we SAS wranglers? Um, and it's like, oh God, sorry. Um, so, it's what I'm going to talk about. So, in, 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 in the beginning, there was the, gen, the, gen, the general markup language, which is an interesting thing I found out, is actually the initials of the three people who came up with GML, uh, IBM. So then became HTML, and then there was XML. Um, so these were markups. Actually, YAML is not a markup language. I actually thought that YAML stood for yet another markup language, but it doesn't. It stands for YAML ain't a markup language. Um, it's actually a human-friendly data serialization standard for all programming languages. So basically, it just makes it, but we all use it as a markup language. So what is its uses? So you can use it for configuration, object persistence, internet messaging, data serialization. Or that's what the website says. I suspect most people only ever use it for configuration or object persistence. If you're actually sending data serialization around, you probably should just use JSON. So what about JSON? Now, JSON is actually, so YAML is actually a superset of JSON, and there is actually one case where valid JSON is not valid YAML. 
Uh, JSON allows you to have multiple keys with the same name. Y YAML doesn't let you do that particularly. Um, and it's actually a thing in the spec. So what about XML? Um, just say no, I think is the answer to that one. <laughs> it's unreadable. Um, I mean, it's good for passing stuff around, but I mean, yes, YAML is human readable. It's actually worth using. Okay, so why are we all becoming YAML engineers? Now, I personally blame our, uh, Ari, so our our, 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 our on Twitter, when he finally generated Hira. And then obviously there was CSV, then there was the YAML backend, and basically all of us ended up doing stuff with YAML. I mean, I've actually did at my current place, we actually did a transition from using CSV to higher data to using YAML, and it was like, yeah, it was much better, we could read it. CSV was just unreadable. And then you end up with a lot of stuff. So other things for, so that's how I think we started, and then other tools picked it up. Um, actually, this is a very fun thing we have at work. So this is some YAML in our Puppet repo, which, gen which is an ERB file, which generates YAML to generate XML to generate shell scripts to actually um, to actually like do Jenkins job builder. So that's Jenkins job builder. It's like, so the YAML is the readable version of it. And yes, I probably won't ever stop talking to be honest. Um, so yeah, so it's sort of a good thing. And then, then other tools picked up. Like, and there's so what other things use YAML these days? So Kubernetes, Docker Compose, Cloud Foundry, Concourse, Travis YAML, Ansible. I think Ansible was actually one of the things that made it really big that we were using YAML for everything. I mean, who wants to do for loops in YAML? But there you go. Um, I don't know. You can do all sorts of things. So this is a Kubernetes YAML file. It has a lot. This is, very, this is only 24 lines of it. But you, get, you see all this YAML. And I've been to talks to people show, and this is how we configured it, and then have a cat of about 1,000 lines of YAML stream pass, which you can't read. So, so you read about all sorts of these tools where people actually then have YAML, generating YAML, and it's like, OK, fine, um, I think. And then you have things like JSON it, uh, case on it as well, I think someone's doing. And some people are trying to now write tools for Kubernetes to not actually use YAML. I mean, actually, you technically can use JSON. So Docker Compose is YAML. As I say here, at least it's not a shell script. That's one of the things which really gets me about Docker, is the fact that if you actually look at it, a Docker file is just a shell script. Um, so, I don't know, I think it's a good way to do it, and it actually does describe a system. Um, so, one of the big problems that people have had with YAML in the past, especially in the Ruby world, is the security <laughs> stuff. Because Ruby would just load the objects and go, yay, I'll do things. So actually, someone's written safe YAML, which is a linter to check. If you're just doing configuration, safe YAML should probably do enough of it. So the other day, Gareth was, I think, actually having a discussion with uh, Luke, actually, about what do we are all now. He said, coin the term YAML farmer. They talk about YAML herders. Obviously, since YAML is supposed to rhyme with camel, it actually makes a lot, a lot of sense. So the question, are we all YAML engineers now? So yes, we probably are, although obviously there are lots of other markup languages as well. So there's HCL if you're doing Terraform, JSON if you really have to. Um, all that sort of things. I mean, so I actually think we're all markup language engineers now, and the answer to that is yes. Although there's actually a certain amount that we're probably all becoming SAS wranglers as well, because that's not a that's what we all do. Then we're just putting components to pop together and stuff like that. Unlike sort of just having a massive big thing. Anyway, thank you much. Um, we're hiring. Um, not that I care. I'm leaving. Um, <laughs> Uh, hey everybody, uh, my name is Spencer, uh, my Twitter handle is Nibblizer, and I work at the IBM Cloud. Um, this is a talk called uh, A Tale of Servers, Sadness, and Redemption, um, and it's kind of going to be my story a little bit. Um, so this is the first server I ever had root access on. Um, it's a Sunfire 280R with two screaming fast uh, Spark processors at 233 megahertz. Um, this was back at university, and so the, the server actually had an a, like an asset tag on it, so it couldn't leave, but we decided that the faceplate could be ripped off, and so now it lives in my, in my office. Um, this was back when I, first I attended the university, and then I worked at the university kind of doing general IT stuff, and I and sysadmin type stuff, and I really became enamored with the idea of playing with Unix and, and configuring Sun workstations and all that stuff. And for anybody who didn't have the pleasure of working with Sun, it was dope. Um, this is the inside of that server, and the green thing is actually the screwdriver that they left in the box for you. So you could take the main case off with just kind of finger nut type stuff, 
and then there was a screwdriver right there with the right bit and stuff so you could get into the RAM and the hard drive and, and the processors and all that stuff. So I really enjoyed kind of configuring. I got kind of good at Puppet, like I kind of built a career out of, or that was like the first thing I did with my career. I wrote a lot of YAML, as we learned about today. Um, the back plane of this thing, there wasn't like a Dell IDirect type thing. There was a, like a serial console with a fourth prompt that you could use to boot the server or disconnect or renumber um, individual hard drives and stuff like that. It was just a much easier system to work with and there was a ton of control. And in that role, I had a ton of flexibility. And then I sort of left university land and I went into the, the real world and, and I joined this large trucking company. Oh, this is a stock photo, but I joined this large trucking company and the trucking company, it wasn't good. There was this giant app that we were trying to build. Um, there was, we have both kinds of database, MS SQL and Oracle. Um, it was all the stuff, but what I really, and it was kind of the thing where the app was always on fire and there was war rooms and alerts and it was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. But what I really learned at that place was kind of two things. The first was it was a real, real slap in the face and, and direct uh, knowledge of siloing, right? There was a VMware team and a Red Hat team and a network team and an iOS team, you know? And it was very difficult to, to get anything done outside of those. And then what people would end up doing is not picking the technology solution that made sense. They picked the technology solution that they could implement inside their control envelope. The second thing I learned a lot about was ITIL. Like this was change management run amok. And of course with the app on fire all the time, what does management do? They, they crank down on change management, which means you can't make any meaningful changes to the production infrastructure. And then you have some kind of a SEV1 issue and they do a bunch of emergency changes anyway, so you don't even understand what you have in the production environment. Um, and that made it, it was a very difficult, it wasn't a particularly fun job to work at. I, I actually kind of hated it. But now later in my career, I look back on those two things and I say, wow, I learned kind of a lot. I learned all the right things that I needed to learn. Um, after I worked at the trucking company, I worked at a company that made printers, a, a big company that made printers. I'm not going to say the name, but you can probably figure it out. Um, <laughs> it's not that company. Uh, and, and it was a similar kind of job. I was an ops person and there, was, there were nine of us spread across the globe and our job was to keep this CI system running and it wasn't good. This is the sadness part of the talk. Um, you know, it was alert city and we kind of hit that place of that, that death spiral where there's alerts and issues all the time and you're spending all your time fixing that so there's no time to do real work to improve the stability of the platform. But we also kind of got let down by the leadership. Like the, the person in charge of the team was pretty green. And the architecture team was pretty out to lunch. There was an architect, like in name only, but uh, that architect had four other things going on, and we were the, the last one that got anything. And the, the the direct manager had a pretty did a pretty poor job of, of setting expectations up and protecting the team from all the like random crap of like my code can't work. And of course, when you're on the CI team, like it's like you're in every developer's way, blocking, blocking, blocking. It's it it not no, not a, not the experience we wanted. Um. But I enjoyed it quite a bit, uh, despite all that chaos, because there was a lot of technical problems to solve. But what kind of kept coming back is like, well, we can solve code problems all day, but that wasn't the really the thing holding back in either of these organizations. So the path to redemption for me, um, in November, they said, Spencer, I work at IBM now, they said, Spencer, we need somebody to run the team, to be the manager of the team. And I said, yeah, okay. Like, I've never really been held back because the technology don't work or we can't find tools to put together. The problem is we don't have competent leadership that can communicate uh, down and up and set expectations and be empathy and all those things that I'm actually decent at. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll be the manager and I'm chasing that dream for the next couple of years. Um, so hopefully maybe next year I'll come back to the management camp and give you a, a story of my first year as a, as a technical manager and I'll give you the story. Thank you. Uh, my name is Bram, and I'm here to introduce uh, a little group called DevSec.io, and we're doing a big experiment to see if I can get two places on time. Uh, four, five, no. Uh, so this is how um, most of my test work, when I um, do it, uh, happens. It works in practice, does it work in theory, so you always end up trying to write tests uh, uh, on prod. Some of us are lucky enough to have a, a test system that isn't prod, 
Um, for people that can write puppet code, this is a simple SSH install and then a check to work out if um, your puppet code will actually work. It's a simple I install package with a certain package name. Um, but how many of us would actually work out that it would fail on a central system because we used the wrong name? And this is where Inspect comes into uh, to play. It's an open source testing framework that extends on uh, the work that ServerSpec did. And uh, then you end up with actual tests you can run against live systems where you can uh, work out if, if and when your puppet applies or your Ansible or your chef. It also works for those. Um, well, it works on any running system, so you can actually work out if your code actually got applied properly and if it, um, it will work. If you run Inspec against one of your machines, uh, you get a report like this on your uh, command line. It will have nice little green and red tags. Um, this is the scariest DM I ever got. Um, the intern just fixed our SSH config um, just when I was about to board a plane. Um, <laughs> yep. Um, that most of the time you can work out what this is actually an entry to the obfuscated Python uh, competition. This is valid Python. Uh, some of our pop. <laughs> It's, it's beautiful. Uh, some of our puppet code, unfortunately, looks the same. So can you work out if the change the intern made to your SSH uh, config actually uh, kills or opens up any ports? Um, so in spec, as server spec, you can actually work out um, uh, profiles. Um, like, for instance, there's lots and lots of standards, SOX, PCI, PIPA, <laughs> if you're uh, working with uh, patient data. Um, there are big PDFs, lists of stuff that why you need to think about which uh, uh, what people can act, get access. Uh, yeah, your SSH, your firewall settings. You can all model it in Inspec. You can then run it against your stuff. Um, this is where we're getting close to DevSec. Um, Inspec has the notion of profiles. So in what the DevSec guys do, we create profiles based on these long, 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 long documents that um, describe best practices. There's a, a, a couple of profiles we provide. So it's OSS hardening, SSH hardening, then there's upper, uh, other ones. Uh, for our, the Chef fans or people that use Puppet and Chef, you can actually use these profiles. You can mention these profiles while running your test. You don't have to rewrite them again. You just say, run my test, and then I'll use this other profile. In this case, this is my puppet code that actually tags on the SSH hardening uh, stuff. Um, as a team, we also provide sample hardening implementations for most of these. Uh, there's Apache as well, but that's a bit old, so I'm, I'm not mentioning them. And then um, we do it for... Um, all of the, the big tools, so there's Ansible, Chef, Puppet. Um, if you're interested in adding salt stack, then please join. Um, but at the moment, this is the big three that we provide. And um, this is the link. Uh, if you ever want to get in contact, please join us. We're always looking for new people. Uh, we're on all the Twitters, on Gitter, and uh, we have links to all our modules, cookbooks, and uh, playbooks. Thank you. Do you want to give a little preamble as to why this is happening? Um, you're running Ignite, right? Huh? You're doing it Ignite, right? I thought we were doing sponsor coach. <laughs> <laughs> I knew this question. <laughs> there was a little confusion, and so my sponsor pitch got turned into an Ignite. And so <laughs> they're kind enough to let me do it. So like, my coworker gave me some slides, so I just need to run through this real quick to do this pitch. All right, so I work for a company called Sysdig. Uh, we have a booth here. Maybe you came by and talked to us. Uh, I did used to work for Chef, which is why I'm here. Uh, what is, th is this my deck? Yeah. <laughs> what did you do? Now you just broke. Oh, OK. So is that all right? No, we need to have another one also. Yeah, that one also. Yeah. Or it won't be straight, but. How's that? Does that work? Uh, so we have a container intelligence platform. We have uh, some commercial products uh, built around security and monitoring for containers, uh, Kubernetes, and all the appropriate buzzwords. What? Is 
Uh, anyway, <laughs> I'll try and get through this. <laughs> uh, it was founded by uh, an Italian, uh, Loris uh, Dio, Dio Gian, anyone want to pronounce that for me? Uh, he created Wireshark, anyone ever use Wireshark? So if you're familiar with Wireshark and TCB dump, you'll be familiar with what Sysdig does. <laughs> You know, I normally don't get nervous for talks, but... <laughs> can I go next? Oh good, I can. Uh, so our platform looks like this. So we have commercial products, but we also have a series of open source products that do, uh, or projects that do different things. Uh, Sysdig is the one that we were founded with, uh, and then Sysdig Inspect is more of a... <laughs> GUI-based tool. Speaking of GUI, I guess. Oh. <laughs> oh. Um, what we do is we pull in a lot of information uh, from your container runtimes, and then we'll also pull in information from Kubernetes or whatever your orchestrator is, and we'll put all that together inside of Sysdig, and it kind of gives you a lot more context about how things are running. <laughs> Sysdig, uh, we use Sysdig, the open source tool for troubleshooting and forensics. Uh, you can basically take a capture of all the system calls that are happening on a Linux system, and then you can take that capture, much like Wireshark, and uh, load it up and basically dissect it. You gonna keep doing this? <laughs> uh, the architecture looks like this. There's a kernel module that gets loaded in. Uh, and that goes into an event buffer, and then you're able to write that out to a file. Uh, you're also able to do uh, lots of filters as well. So the filtering language is actually really, really powerful, much like it is with TCP dump. Uh, and then uh, Sysdig Inspect, like I said, it's the GUI-based tool that looks a lot like Wireshark. You can load that capture up. We give you a lot of tiles out of the box so you can do common filters that you would want to to look at like HTTP errors and file system errors and so thing. So, or. <laughs> I'm really disappointed in you. <laughs> uh, Sysdig Falco is our other uh, open source project. It's once again a kernel module, but what you can do is you can write rules and then these rules basically will fire when one of these conditions are met. So somebody breaks into your system. <laughs> so we thought it was rather amusing uh, that you know tribalism is bad, but we've been bashing YAML this entire conference. Right, everyone? So visit our booth. We also have a workshop tomorrow as well, uh, and there's still about 15 seats available if you want to join us for that. Thank you. <laughs>